Good morning, everybody. I'm Bob Wright with the University of Nebraska. I'm going to be the co-moderator with Bob Cook from University of Minnesota to the uh, Soybean Management uh, Re Regional Webinar Series. We'll have another webinar at the same time a week from today. Uh, we have several talks today that relate to insights on distribution, scouting, ecology, and chemical control of the soybean gall midge. So thanks everybody for joining us. Uh, we'd like to acknowledge Phyllis Bongard who developed the website and the uh, registration process. And she'll be providing some information later on how to, how to sign up for CCA credits. If you saw the introductory slides, we have multiple organizations and agencies who's contributed to the research we've been doing the last couple of years on the soybean uh, gall midge, uh, particularly the North Central Soybean Research Program, our state uh, soybean commodity boards, and the USDA NIFA through grants and through the North Central IPM Program Center and our industry sponsors. And also special thanks to multiple farmers that have allowed us to work on their fields uh, to address this issue. We couldn't have made as much progress or hardly any progress without their cooperation and uh, willingness to uh, put up with our interference as we do research. And we just we wanna remind people, this is meant to be a discussion, not just a lecture. We're gonna pause after each speaker to allow some questions. If you have questions, please use the Q&A uh, button at the bottom of your, of your screen for questions to the speakers. If you have technical issues, you can post those in the chat. Um, let's see, Bob, have, Bob Cook, have I forgotten any major points? Okay. Oh, I think you covered it well. Okay, thank you. Well, our first speaker will be Aaron Hodson from Iowa State University. He'll be talking about distribution, identification, scouting, and injury scores. So I'll turn it over to Aaron. Take it away. All right. Thanks, Bob. And Bob, um, hopefully everybody can see my screen. Um, I'm up first, and we realize that there's there's some of you participating today that have been dealing with soybean gallmage for four or five, maybe more years, but there's also some people joining today that maybe not sure if they have it or they are just interested in learning about a new pest. And so my job is to just give a really quick high level overview of identification, the current distribution, some scouting tips, and a new injury score. That's going to be talked about quite a bit throughout the rest of the time. All right, so this is a brand new species and it's a fly in the midge family, Ceciomyidae. It got an official species description in 2019 from an alum of Iowa State, Raymond Gagne. And uh, you can see two different photos here, a top shot and a side shot. And hopefully what you take away is they have long white and black banded legs. They have long antennae mottled wings and orange bodies. And if you look at the right-handed photo, see the female's a little bit longer and she has a long ovipositor for laying eggs. Um, what we really care about as far as the most important life stage are the larvae. And the larvae of flies are called maggots. The, the most fully developed instar, the third instar is also about a quarter inch in length. Um, they go through three instars after hatching from an egg and the first are, are hard to see, they're small, but they're also translucent and they don't have a lot of distinct figure, uh, features. But uh, as they move into the second and third instar, they'll get bigger and take on a bit more color. And so you see sort of an orange tinge in the second instar. And then uh, the third instar is bright orange, kind of like a little mandarin slice. Uh, we, when, when we have an economic pest like soybean gallmage, uh, many of us who are field crop entomologists get very excited to learn more about the biology and management, especially when it can impact yield. And so uh, as, as Bob Wright mentioned at the beginning, we've had uh, been fortunate to have some variety of funding sources, especially the North, North Central Soybean Research Program and the United Soybean Board to help us understand where these midges are and maybe where are some new spots they might be located. And so all these people have been dedicated to looking for soybean gall midge over the last couple of years. 
And uh, last year, 2021, we had over 1,700 fields, commercial fields that we scouted in total with, uh, that represented 267 counties in the North Central region. And you can tell by the yellow dots, we have soybean gall midge in five states, Minnesota, South Dakota, Nebraska, Iowa, and Missouri. Uh, if you are really into the numbers, this is a map that Justin has generated showing where we've had our, our positive detections since 2018. And um, with the five states here, it represents a total of 140 counties. We had 26 new counties put on the map last year. And um, you can see that in the green counties. And um, I agree with most of the folks um, that are panelists today that I think we're just getting really good at finding soybean gall midge. The map doesn't necessarily represent um, the spread or the movement because we're finding them um, because we're looking for them quite a lot. So um, they do, if you look at the map, they do kind of look like they're congregated around that like I-29 corridor. And in my opinion, maybe Justin will disagree with me that it seems like the heaviest, most persistent infestations are in Nebraska. I just wanted to give you a little bit uh, a closer snapshot of these detailed transects that we're doing. This is a map of Iowa and the, all the fields that we sampled in 2021. We sampled 44 counties and uh, approximately 60 fields had so soybean gall midge at some level, that's 43%. Um, so we would sample at least three fields per county. And we started in the West and moved to the East or the central part of the state until we couldn't find them anymore. And just as an example, Nebraska did something very similar and they've been doing this for a long time and they had approximately 56% of the fields they sampled had some, some level of midges last year. Uh, when first trying to, to understand when midges can infest plants, uh, through our observations and others, it's been noted that we can't find larvae in cotyledon or B1 stage soybean. They tend to infest a plant B2 or later. And so I, Justin has some nice photos here. And we think with the, with the rapid growth that soybean has mm -hmm. under ideal conditions, you would, you would see little fissures or cracks or thinning spots start to form on the stem. And we think this is ideal for those really small, delicate flies to lay eggs. I think that the last photo on the right is especially great because you're going to see eggs, small larvae and large larvae all in the same plant. And so to answer a question about how many feet, you know, how many eggs can a female lay at one time or how many they can lay over the, their lifetime, we don't know that yet, but it is common to see a plant with different life stages all, all at the same time. Justin also has some really nice photos of plants that are at different growth stages infested with soybean gall midge. So I said V2 or later, and that is quite possible where you have vegetative plants that die, but you can also have plants that are first infested during the seed and or pot and seed development. So you could have new plants being infested later in the season. If you are not sure if you have soybean gall midge or you're, you're looking at new fields, new counties, and you want to know if you have it or not, I think one of the best tools you can have is a little pocket knife to split stalks or peel back the bark of the outer stem. You're unlikely to find adults. So our recommendation is look for the larvae because they're, they're sort of um, held hostage on those stems for a while. So that they're gonna be easy to find um, right above the stem, uh, or sorry, right above the soil line within the stem. Our seasoned crop consultants, agronomists, farmers, and extension folks, I think would be able to distinguish some plant pathogens that you might see in soybean seedlings. And it'd be important to distinguish uh, pathogens from soybean gall midge. Now that the two can co-occur, they can be there at the same time, but they don't necessarily need to be, need to be there at the same time. So uh, visually from the outside of the plant, you're, you might see some discoloration Gertilene, some lesions forming. So that's when opening up the stem and looking for larvae becomes really important for the confirmation. My, my experience, and I, I don't, I'd be interested to hear from the other panelists when we get into questions, but if I am wondering if I have soybean gall midge or not, I usually tend to focus my efforts on field edges, especially when they're butted up right next to corn where soybean was grown the previous season. And we'll talk a little bit more about the ecology and life cycle a bit later, but uh, I would be looking at the first 10, 15 rows on the edge. And even if they're separated by 
uh, a waterway, grasses, tree line, roads, I still would focus my efforts on the edges to where soybean was grown the previous season. But likely what you're going to see is some healthy plants mixed in with some stressed, wilted, browning, or even dead plants. And so it usually starts off as a blob at the, at the edge of the field, and that blob can get bigger and bigger. And so could be mistaken for spider mites or pathogens. Uh, so that's why it'd be important to take a closer look. If you have access to aerial photography, this is how some people are first confirming soybean gall midge in very large fields or in irregular shape fields. Uh, the photo on the left is a good one to show sort of how some fields are set up in an irregular way. So you see corn on the left and soybean on the right. And that margin, the interface between the two fields is where you see a lot of plant death associated with soybean gall midge. So those are, those are two like right next to each other. But the photo on the right, it's, it's uh, separated by a road, um, but you almost always see the highest infestations, plant death along the edge, and then it can dissipate and go into the field uh, depending on the size and the shape. So tips for sampling in the vegetative stage, uh, you uh, are going to be seeing small pockets of plants that don't look quite right. And so they're going to look stressed, wilted, and sometimes can die. But because of the, the compensation nature of soybean, the oftentimes soybean will help fill in the gap within rows. And then as they get a little bit bigger and trying to close the canopy. So you're going to notice some um, browning discolored um, uh, girdled stems right above the soil line. And then again, if you were taking your knife and opening it up, hopefully you'd see, well, not hopefully, but your confirmation would be that you would see soybean gall midge as opposed to maybe a pathogen. Later in the season, I think it gets harder to have a first detection of soybean gall midge because soybean plants just fill in the gaps. And so as plants get infested and die, it is hard to see if you're looking down on the canopy because uh, soybean plants will kind of cover that up, especially if they don't get infested until later in the season. So uh, that feeding area becomes really brittle. And um, so you could have, again, some plants that look apparently good, they're standing, but they're lodged or broken at the base and just held up by surrounding plants. When it gets really bad, sometimes uh, those areas that uh, die off maybe earlier in the season can get taken over by weeds. And so sometimes people don't notice gaps in the fields because they still look green and they're actually weeds instead of soybean. And so what I like to do later in the season is um, push apart the canopy, focus my attention at the base, looking for discolored or black uh, lesions. And then sometimes you might even hear like a crack or a snap. It's not as dramatic as you would see for corn with the push test, but you're gonna hear little pops. And again, that, that uh, stem right above the soil line can become very brittle. So there's, it's a pest that is definitely of economic concern and we are trying to better understand what is that economic uh, loss potential in different scenarios. And so Justin and I had a graduate student, Mitchell Helton, who looked at uh, estimating injury based on visual injury on plants. And so it's somewhat similar if you're familiar with the zero to three node injury score that we use for corn rootworm. We're trying to develop something that is a visual score that would be easy to walk in for an agronomist, a researcher, or even a farmer and estimate potential yield losses. And so he's taken some advice from the disease, the plant pathology world, and estimating the area under the severity progress curve. Um, with a number of small plot trials that Nebraska and Iowa had in 2019 and 20. And just a couple different ways to show that it's really highly correlated. The more injury you have, the more yield loss you could expect. And so we're still working a bit on this, trying to make it really usable for people that are doing research, are trying to scout fields and then decide whether or not action is needed, or if you could expect to even break even with potential treatments that we'll talk about uh, next week. So the injury score is, is, is hopefully fair, fairly intuitive. It's a zero to four, and it's just based on visual, visual injury. So for example, a score of a one would be 25% of the plants injured. A score of a two would be 50%. A score of a three would be 75%. And a score of a four would be nearly 100%. Uh, you know, not a lot of plants remaining. So you could do it on a small plot level, it would be more difficult to do it on a field level, um, but um, you're gonna hear a lot about the zero to four uh, injury scale today and next week. So I just wanted to introduce you to that. So these are some visual representations that Mitchell took 
um, again, to represent. It's, it's easier to do in the vegetative period, but you could do it over time. You could sample every month and, and estimate these scores and, and check the progress of the injury as it progresses. And it would give you some idea of the uh, yield loss that you could expect. So that's real quick. I, I talked really fast, um, but I wanna make sure like all the other uh, folks on today's schedule get a chance. So that was just a real brief introduction. It's easy to find me on Twitter. We'll be tweeting about you guys uh, today and next week. So Bob and Bob, how am I doing? Bob, do we have time for a question? Sure. So. Aaron, uh, we got a question about potential lookalikes mm. for the larvae in soybean. And yeah, uh, great. the question is, there are some other orangish colored larvae out there. How yeah, does really... the, is the, uh, the bright orange versus maybe a dull orange? And, and what else might we confuse? Yeah, this? that's great. Um, I think if you're scouting, um, you are going to find lots of stuff. Um, the, the soybean gall midge is not the only midge that you're going to see out in the, in the agricultural landscape. Um, in my experience, I haven't found any other midges infesting soybean, but that's not the case when it comes to areas like Minnesota and Wisconsin. And Bob, you, you certainly have seen it more than I have with the white, uh, white mold gall midge. You wanna just briefly mention that? Yeah, so, so there is another gall midge that feeds on white mold in soybean and in other plants. As far as we know, it's not a plant pest. It, it's feeding on that fungus. It's in the same family. So the larvae look very similar, similar size, and they have that orange color. Um, a lot of times they, they, don't, they don't really seem to be as bright of an orange, but I'm not sure that that's a, you know, a, a perfect distinguishing character. I think we want to look at more where those infestations are occurring, right? Yeah. So this lookalike is associated with the mycelia, the white mold. But if you're looking at the galls themselves, the lesions at the base of the plant, it's pretty much only um, soybean gall midge in there. We found a few other flies, a tiny, tiny percentage of other flies in there, but it's mainly soybean gall midge there. Yeah, thanks, Bob. Um, I have seen orange colored maggots in other kinds of plants. Um, sometimes if I'm splitting open stalks from some pigweeds, I've seen some uh, orangish colored maggots, but I, I don't assume that they would be soybean gall midge there. Uh, they look really different to me. They're, they're quite a bit bigger, so I'm not exactly sure what they are, but I don't think they're soybean gall midge. Um, I, I, you know, in, in Iowa, we don't have a lot of stem boring soybean pests, but I realize there, there's kind of people from all over the, the region. And so um, like Kansas, I think Nebraska might have some stem boring soybean pests, but look quite different than soybean gall midge, but if you're splitting open stocks, you may see other stuff. Yeah, really good question. Maybe we should take the question from David Pike here and then okay. we'll, we'll move on. I think some of the other questions will be answered by other speakers, but when scoring plants on the injury scale, are you scoring dead plants or infected plants? Yeah. Uh, Really good question. So um, it's it's a visual score from from the external part of the plant. So the, do they look like, you, you know, sometimes you can you can see the lesions or the the darkening or even the girdling from the outside. Uh, sometimes they just look like they're sort of rapidly wilting or discoloring. Um, so it's not necessarily a dead plant. It could be a plant that is infested and is weakened. I would include those two. <clears throat> Okay, we'll come back and, and get some of these other questions later. And uh, Thanks, some, of the, some of the subsequent speakers may uh, answer some of the questions. So we'll move on to Justin McMechan, who will talk about soybean gall midge biology and ecology. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Dr. Wright, for introducing me. And, and uh, as you can see, I'm, I'm going to cover biology and ecology, which is a pretty big and dense topic, but I've got a few uh, of my students that are going to help with this as well to piece out some of the things that we've learned on this. Uh, the list of speakers are everybody that's, uh, you know, the panelists that you're seeing today, because uh, we've all had some contribution to the understanding of this insect. So Aaron, Aaron did a really nice job of covering uh, kind of what this insect looks like. And, and uh, I, I think she's right from our conversations, Nebraska's definitely taken a bit of a beating uh, when it comes to soybean gall, which that has changed from year to year. And this is just one example from a photo Nick Tinsley took in 2020. Um, and so 
uh, if I could get my slides to advance. My goal uh, over this talk is, is to talk about the overwintering source for adults em emergence. We've done that for, for a couple years now. Uh, I'm going to have uh, Mikaelis in Lima, a master student, talk about the distribution cocoons in the soil. Uh, then we'll come back and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about adult emergence and infestation of plants uh, and, and larval abundance, which uh, Vilma Montenegro, who will speak in the um, insecticide portion, I'm going to cover just one slide that she has uh, on that. She's done a lot of work in that area. And then Ravneet Carr, who's another master's student, will cover uh, the survey, uh, which you can see is a very large survey, but just to focus on Nebraska and what we've been seeing. And then we'll talk a little bit about interaction of, of hail damaged plants. And these are uh, the, the major uh, contributors to the funding sources for this. So as, as Bob Wright mentioned, we wouldn't have much without them. Um, so we'll, we'll visit this slide a number of times throughout this talk. We're going to break away from it uh, on occasion to talk about the different parts of this life cycle of soybean gallmage. Uh, and we're going to start with these silken cocoons, which are the uh, overwintering stage for, for soybean gallmage. And so that's, that's where we'll start this conversation. I'm just going to set things up for, for Mika Ellison to talk about where they are in the soil profile and their distribution in the field. But this photo, uh, which we, we, again, we've been doing this for a couple of years, shows all these orange flags all over the place in this field. And it highlights um, where we were tracking uh, for potential adult emergence in the spring. And, and uh, you could see that we've got some over in the ditches, uh, in the ditch between the fields, as well as along the field edge. Uh, this is last year's soybean field out here. Uh, and then this would be uh, corn the previous year. So tracking from both sites. Don't need to show you a lot of graphs or anything on this because the, the data is pretty solid. 99% of those adults that have emerged over the last few years have been from last year's soybean fields. So those injured fields that Aaron and I have been showing you uh, from, from back in 2021, Gallmage is in those fields right now. Uh, we have never been able to detect them in last year's cornfield. So that, that cornfield has never shown uh, adult emergence. So a strong link of very few cases where we can pick them up along the field border but the larvae have the capability to, to move away from the plant. Um, and so they can, they can potentially get into those field bordered areas. So I'm gonna kick it over to, to Mika Ellison and, and mute myself here and, and have him uh, talk about the distribution of cocoons in the soil. Go ahead, Mika. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mika Mika for the introduction. Uh, as mentioned, my name is Mikael Lima. I am a student, a master's student here at the University of Nebraska. I'm part of the team who work with the soybean gallmage in the soil. And I'm going to present a little bit here about our work from 2019, data set collected from uh, one of our students, Tainara Posebom, and 2021, the data collected by me. The next. So the set of data, the two set of data that I'm going to present to you today is based on a two year research developed in the west of Nebraska from this uh, cities, these sites located here in the map. Uh, the set of data from 2019 are marked in yellow spots and from 2021 are, are marked in blue spots. Next, just, uh, yeah, here, um, as mentioned already, we have infestation, we have part of the, the, the life of cycle there are in the soil, and we are willing to study that to see how is the distribution of this insect in the soil, the cocoon. So we collect from those fields in both years, uh, samples from five feet, 20 and 50 feet from the field edge. The samples were based in a core of undisturbed soil sample with uh, six inch deep and three inch wide. And we collect in six replication uh, per site from each of those distance. Next, just uh, so here, this picture is maybe it isn't kind to show you. Try to explain. We collect those soil samples from infest fields, but we don't actually know how is the distribution of these cocoons in the soil. So, based on the kind of sample that we have, where the structure of the layers are kept, we you, you can go ahead next. We split those soil samples in layers of um, 0 0.75 inch deep. And we did it to check how was the distribution each of those layers in the soil profile. Can go ahead. 
Thanks. So keeping those layers of soil sample, we expect to have like the number of coupons from each of those layers. The process of those uh, layers were did like uh, separate and the soil process was based in wash the soil to remove the amount of clay and soil from the sample. And as we can see here from A to C on those pictures, we can see how was the process based. It was in the basin and wash the soil to remove the amount of clay. And when we go here to see, we got like just a little bit of debris, ideally with the cocoons. So we sprayed this field debris in a field milker as a color whitish. And then that would make it easy to count the number of cocoons in the scope. As you can see, oh, can you come back just a little bit? Yeah, thanks. As we can see here in the left corner, down in the left corner, we have a picture of what we, we've been looking for. Those are the larvae kinds of cocoons and the pupae. And the E, in the picture E is just based to you see how small is this insect in this stage. Yeah, you can go ahead. Thanks. Um, going to our results, those are the fields where we collect the soil samples and where we collect the number of cocoons. So we can see the same pattern here in 2021 and 2020 in 2019, uh, next. So in Ithaca, we got the higher number of cocoons, but it's important to say that those fields, there are fields that have a overlap of crop, uh, soybean crop. So that makes some sense. And ego, we didn't get an emergence here in 2021. Uh, next. Here is the results, the number of cocoons by distance from the field edge. So uh, we got basically the same pattern in 2021, in 2019. And you can go ahead, just thanks. Uh, here in the first layer, we got the fewer, the lower number of cocoons from both ears. Uh, here is one of the most important parts of our work because we got here the number of cocoons per layer. Uh, next, here we got a very high number of cocoons when you compare with the other layers in the first layer. We got like more than 63% of the cocoons and followed by the second layer with 23%. Uh, next, here's a quick comparison between 2019 and 2021, where we got, uh, next, where we got the same pattern of distribution. In the first layer, we also got the higher number of cocoons with more than 87% of the cocoons found in, that, in those samples, in, in the layers. Uh, next. Uh, yeah. So to conclude, uh, the soybean gallmid cocoons were detected in all the samples collected from the, the studied fields, except from Eagle 2021, although it's important to say that we got uh, emergence, adult emergence from that field. Next. Um, when we check the number of cocoons per distance, only 18% from these cocoons were found in the fifth, five feet from the field head. Uh, this is also very important here. Uh, 75, about 75% of the soybean gallmid cocoons were found in the first layer, well, in the first uh, inch of soil, and nine, nine, seven percent, more than 97% of the soybean gallmid cocoons were found in the three first layer of soil. And I think that's it from my part. Thanks, Justin. Great, thank you, Mika. Uh, so yeah, to highlight, uh, you know, Mika's really uh, done a nice job along with Tainara and all the others listed on there of, of locating those cocoons uh, in, in the soil profile. And this figure just reiterates, you know, that we, we are last year's soybean field, typically for Nebraska, this year's corn field. And, and those cocoons are distributed in that soil. Mick is also doing work in, in this year's soybean field with the, the temporal distribution and a lot of other work around that. So I wanna continue framing this understanding for you of how this, this situation develops um, each, each year um, for, our, for our problem fields here. So we're gonna move from silk and cocoons uh, in, in the overwintering stage, which are found in last year's soybean fields to, to now talking about adult emergence which is where a large amount of our, our effort in communicating with you and some of the management tactics we'll talk about later tend to target this, this time period. And so from that overwintering site, you've probably seen this if you've been following soybean gallmage, which is that we have these cages placed out in last year's soybean field all along the edge of the field to track adult emergence from those, those sites. 
Um, and we start this usually in, in May here in East Central Nebraska and around that time in other states. Uh, we've had about 32 sites or so each year uh, tracking that, that emergence. And if you're new to soybean gallmage or you haven't been following as closely with us, this Join the Alert Network is a chance to get kind of the first reports of when we see that insect each year. And here's just the last couple years of first adult emergence that we've seen, uh, which was June 14th in 2019. Uh, captures both in, in Iowa and Nebraska on the same day for that first adult capture. Um, and then 2020, the 10th of June, and then in Nebraska here, uh, slide back uh, you know, 10 days or more to uh, May 31st uh, in 2021 at Syracuse, Nebraska. And so if you want to join that network, um, you could just go down and hit the Join the Alert Network. An automated phone call, text message, and email will, will come through that system. So I, these next few slides uh, to frame management, this is some of the most important things uh, to, to, to frame the challenges we're gonna have with management of soybean gallmage. And so I'm gonna go through each year on this graph showing you the duration of adult emergence only from the overwintering source, that, that last year's soybean field. And so what you see here is 2019, this was the first year we did this. Uh, you know That emergence was right around 15 or 16 days uh, duration, the number of days from first to last capture from overwintering sites. Uh, if we move ahead to 2020, you can see this, this ugly trend start to show up, which is an increasing average duration of adult emergence up to about 26 days. So we're, we're moving uh, between two very different scenarios. 2019, kind of an achievable period uh, where we, we might get efficient control of this to 2020, getting more and more challenging that any single tactic is gonna be effective against this insect. And, and just to make this look slightly worse, we'll put 2021 up there, which you can see, you know, it, it's an unfortunate trend that we're under and hopefully this will change, but we're now up around 36 days on average for adult emergence from overwintering sites, um, you know, up, upwards to 44 uh, at the top end of that. So that, that's a very challenging scenario. The longer that emergence occurred, the harder it is to manage this insect. But there's more detail behind that number, and that partially comes up in the graph you can see here. So this is uh, June, July, August, and September with that May 31st date on the x-axis. On the y-axis is the soybean gallmage adults per cage per day. So, so the number that have emerged as an average from those cages, because we have a different number of cages at each site. You can see that May 31st capture, and then you can see things start to pick up around June 8th. And there's this weird kind of additional bump here out in July, which was pretty consistent across a large number of sites, uh, at least in East Central Nebraska, uh, where we saw this, this late emergence in, in July. The relative importance of that, economically speaking, is probably not as high, but for late planted fields, uh, they may still be able to get established. I've added some dots to this uh, to, to just show you first activity at each site, just to show the variation on when we first detect them, depending on the site. So this is Syracuse first detection. Uh, and then you can see other sites here like Davie uh, that, that follow that and a number of sites picking up around the 8th or 9th of June. Uh, but the date period of first emergence varied quite a bit between those sites uh, for, for this particular data set. Soybean gallmage emerges. And you know, as you can see, it has wings. It can fly. How well it flies and how far it flies, we're still trying to figure out. But it, it moves between that overwintering source uh, almost certainly as flight um, and, and could be blown by the wind potentially. And then it fests soybeans in the adjacent field. Uh, and that's how the whole process starts in terms of us starting to find larvae and eventually injury in, uh, in the field if, if it's significant in its number. So just a little bit about eggs and egg laying. Uh, this is the base of a soybean stem. You can see all those fissures that uh, Aaron talked about earlier and that big ovipositor. It's not meant to pierce tissue from what we understand about the species, uh, but it can, uh, it appears to, and through some time lapse in the greenhouse, place those eggs underneath that, that fissure area. Uh, and so they can begin to hatch and develop. And you saw a nice image that Aaron showed this is not uncommon. This insect is very similar to raspberry cane midge, uh, Resiliella theobaldi, which is in the Denmark, Poland area, um, as well as a number of surrounding areas. Uh, and it, it feeds on raspberry and it utilizes the same thing, laying into these uh, open areas, natural openings that can occur from splits in the stem. So we're gonna move from, from eggs now into the larvae that feed on the plant. And I'm just gonna really briefly cover this. 
uh, which is uh, a lot of work that Villa Montenegro has done on the seasonal larval abundance uh, of soybean gall midge. And so this Vilma, as you can see in the graph here, I'll give you a chance to look at this because it takes a bit to digest. On the x-axis is June, July, and August and September. You notice a lot of dots on that graph. That's because Vilma sample plants every three days uh, throughout the entire season. On the y-axis, you see the number of larvae per three plants. And then you see in blue what is first adult emergence. And you can see that things start off relatively low and then pick up in late July, early August. And what I've done is I've added a bar that expands over about a two week period to give you the average number of larvae per three plants that we were picking up over each one of those periods. Just a little bit easier to see the trend uh, during the season. So pretty similar numbers through mid July, they really pick up late July and, and, and August, and then you know kind of decline and get pretty low once we get into September. And this is from Saunders County, Nebraska from just this, this past season. So you know, within that six days of first adult detection, we start to find those, those larvae in the plant. Uh, estimating the number of generations is always a fun task and a typically uh, a typical question that we ask. And so I'm gonna give you our best estimation of that based on field observation. So we have overwintering adults emerging from last year's soybean field. We detect them, you saw the graphs for that. And then we detect them in this year's soybean field. And so the, the length of time, between those two periods uh, is a rough estimation of the number of days per generation with some things that could muddle that number a little bit. And so what we've been picking up is about 27 to 29 days for the last couple of years. That sounds like pretty confident period, just three day period. Let me shake your confidence on that and give you the range of response, which is between 18 and 45 days. And the reason for that is some of the time of planting of this adjacent soybean field and the ability of them to infest those plants, as well as at 18 days, likely the lack of actual first detection of adults, uh, possibly from the overwintering site. And so hopefully that gives you some understanding of what we've been seeing. That's all three years uh, combined. Um, and so just to give you an understanding of that overall set of what we've seen, once they're in soybean, clearly as Aaron indicated, we run into some issues in terms of their visual symptoms showing up. Um, and, and I think all of us wonder uh, when these symptoms and why they get uh, more apparent and, and are more problematic in certain areas of the, the state or, or, or areas uh, of, of certain counties. And so I'm going to move over to uh, kick things off to, to Rob Neat, uh, Carr, who's a master's student, to talk about some survey work that we've been doing, trying to isolate some of the factors uh, for both larval presence and, and plant injury. So uh, Rob Neat, go ahead and take it away. Hi everyone, um, my name is Ravneet Kaur and I'm a second year master's student in the Department of Entomology at UNL. My project is focused on characterizing the factors influencing geographic and host range distribution of soybean gall midge through plant injury, larval abundance, land use, and environmental factors. For this, we did a field survey in 2020 and 2021. Um, so this survey has been done um, in other states as well, but my data will focus only in Nebraska. Um, so for that, we collect, we went to the random soybean fields in Nebraska, East Central Nebraska, and we collected um, information regarding the GPS coordinates of the field, uh, the injury scores at 0, 50, and 100 feet from the field edge. And as Erin mentioned, uh, uh, the injury scores were uh, ranged from zero to four with zero being no visible signs of injury and uh, four being the 100% uh, wilting or dead plants. And we, oh, go back Justin. So we collected other information um, regarding the host plant uh, as we have been seeing uh, soybean gall mage on sweet clover as well. So. Uh, we collected information if we collected it from soybean or from the sweet clover. So, and what was the crop in the adjacent field and what were the uh, larval number per stem, uh, which we I'll be focusing in next slide. So after collecting those stems of soybean and sweet clover plants, uh, which were up to three plant stems uh, per field, we brought them to the lab and counted uh, the larval number which is the white larvae and the orange larvae, and as well as the total larvae per stem, which we found. 
Um, later, we collected uh, data regarding the land use uh, around that sampled field in one mile radius of that sampled field or sampling field um, from USDA CropScape. And as you can see in the first picture, um, this is how it looks on um, the database. So the yellow one represent the corn and green is soybean. Um, the alpha alpha are the other things which I was focusing on the developed areas around it, forests and wetlands. Uh, later I collected Later, I collected data uh, from the Google Earth to see what was the distance of the dense vegetation, which is tall trees or tall grasses from the um, field where I sampled. Uh, and what was that field's distance from the previous year's soybean field? Uh, as I mentioned, as the Justin mentioned previously, that the overwintering uh, generation comes from the previous year's soybean fields. Later, I collected uh, the environmental data, that is the cumulative mean temperature and the cumulative precipitation, what was going on um, around in those areas from where I sampled. Then I compared the number of larvae from sweet clover and soybean plants. We observed that the average larvae per plant stem were, higher, uh, num were numerically higher in sweet clover as compared to the soybean plant. Uh, soybean colmage has also been observed uh, on uh, alpha alpha plants, but during the survey, we only found just one plant uh, which had the soybean gallmish larvae. So my uh, results will be focusing on this portion of Nebraska, the east central portion. Um, and what we observed um, in regarding the distribution of larvae per plant. Uh, so in this map, you can see what, uh, the number of the larvae per plant ranged from one that is dark green to 64 or more that is dark brown in color. We did we took the same approach for the um, distribution of field injury. Uh, and you can see the scale arranged from zero that is dark green uh, to 2.5 or uh, more that is dark brown. And what we observed that the areas which had higher number of average total larvae were also the areas where we observed the average field, uh, higher or greater average field injury. The other variables uh, which uh, are the data which I collected regarding the land use around those areas and the environmental factors, when we observed those for the average larval number, we found that the percentage of soybean planting around the sampled field was the major factor uh, which was influencing uh, the larval number, followed by the percentage of wetlands and the dense vegetation distance of the sample field, uh, dense vegetation distance uh, from the sample field. And for the average field injury, we observed that the distance from dense vegetation uh, and the percent uh, was the major factor influencing the average field injury in the um, sample fields followed by the percentage of soybean, which was grown um, in, the, in that area and followed by a uh, percentage of pastures. In conclusion, we observed that the increased larval numbers were correlated with the greater injury scores. The potential factors which were uh, found uh, increasing the plant injury were the distance from the distance of the sample field from the dense vegetation and distance uh, for, of the sample field from the previous year's soybean field. We also observed that the larger area under soybean uh, planting was related with a greater number of uh, greater number of larvae which we found. And lastly, the larval number were higher, highest in sweet clover as compared to the soybean uh, followed by the alpha alpha. This is how uh, uh, in the first and the second picture you can see this is how it looked. Uh, where we sampled in uh, Nebraska in 2020, uh, you can see on the left image and in 2021. As I mentioned previously, this uh, survey was also done in other states, but my results were focusing only on Nebraska. In future, we are planning to analyze the data from 2021 survey where we covered uh, 245 fields in 54 counties. And this uh, survey was done on East West transits um, in a shorter temporal window of 11 days to avoid the avoid time as a confounding uh, variable there. So that's all, thank you. Thanks, Ravneet. Um, I'm just gonna briefly touch on one thing and then we'll go to questions because I think we're, we're running up on our time. There's a lot to talk about on soybean gallmage, obviously. Uh, one thing I wanted to bring up was, was hail uh, damage and its interactions with soybean gallmage. And, and this is something that some of you may have observed in the field and 
and um, not something that's exactly hammered out as far as its understanding, but uh, worth uh, the process of, of, of understanding risk potentially with this insect and maybe increasing scouting efforts in certain areas and also just understanding some of the historical importance of this insect and how it was first discovered. So when we, when we first ran across what we thought was soybean gall midge uh, back in 2011, which could never be confirmed, uh, Tom Hunt, as well as a few others, found these orange larvae. Um, we, never, we didn't have samples because they weren't of economic importance. And so we can't compare those uh, to, to what we have today to know if it was in fact soybean gall midge but uh, they were found on, on injured or, or diseased plants. And so we were asking the question uh, since we started working on this insect, which is does wounding, uh, you know, mechanical wounding from, from say a hailstorm uh, increase the abundance of larvae on the plant? And, and then could this increase risk the following year? We will not answer all these questions uh, obviously during, during this portion of the talk, uh, but you can see we've been hailing um, causing injury to soybeans using a, a simulated hail machine that was recently built at the uh, University of Nebraska as part of my lab. And uh, this is a good stress reliever uh, if, you're, if we're dealing with too much soybean gallage. And then you can see here just an example of a plant. This is the cotyledonary node, if you can see my pointer on there. And then further up here is a field that we came across that appeared to have been hailed. And that hailstone appears to have that same dark discoloration as what is uh, below. And so uh, we've done a bit of work on this. Regina Stackey was a research scholar here in 2019, and this is her data. And uh, Natasha Yumezu, who's gonna be talking next week uh, about planting dates, is taking over this study uh, to, to look at uh, soybean gallmage's presence relative to injury on the plant. So two graphs here, uh, there's uh, on the x-axis, that first graph with all the dots is the injury points or points where hailstones hit the plant. And, and plant height where that is on the on the plant itself and then larval presence and and uh, and it's it's where it is on on the plant and you can see there's a strong correlation meaning the dots where we find injury we find soybean gallmage larvae for the, the the vast majority of plants which means they do appear to like these injured points on the plant or at least they'll infest them um, and then the second part of this is a timing uh, we did some before gallmage usually shows up at v1 and v3 stage soybeans and then this R1 as you can see was done much later that's that's where we first have flowers I and Natasha just this pattern has been doing a lot of work with this uh, she put in some plots and she started categorizing the amount of injury that was on these stems and you can see we have four initial categories from very light uh, to, to increasingly heavier amounts of damage from from a hailstone and and what seems uh, clear is you can obviously find larvae at the base of the plant pretty low numbers at this particular site of then you can see as we increase that that injury to the stem we tend to get higher larval numbers or greater larval numbers so so lots of work to go on this but if you're scouting fields or you have late season hail and that'd be late july early august this is something uh, to pay attention to uh, in terms of your scouting efforts so a summary last year's soybean field is the source for overwintering adults overwintering it they overwinter as third instar larvae and still in cocoons in the soil the duration is increasing and has been for the last three years, and that's going to pose a challenge for us for management. Uh, larvae are abundant in soybeans, and pretty much from just a, you know that six to seven days after we initially capture adults, uh, they they tend to be present all the way through and even into September with the the foresight years that Bill Montenegro has done. Field surveys are increasing our understanding. It's it's broad at the moment, but we'll we'll be drilling into that. And then this hail damage and in interactions with soybean gallmage is something that we've, we're, we're starting to understand and, and it's worth uh, adding that to your scouting profile. So uh, with that, uh, thanks again to all those funding sources that, that support all the efforts across these states um, and uh, take questions, Bob, if we have a minute or two for questions uh, or if we're, we're running short on time, we can, we can move on. Um, Justin, just as a quick follow-up, there's a question about rolling early, like V2, V3 beans, kind of following up on the idea of the hail, do you think that would increase the risk for soybean gall midge infestation, you know, with the potential injury there? I've, I've never uh, had the opportunity to observe fields like that. So I, it, what, what I'm going to give you is speculation based on, on how they can infest plants. Once we're, once we're at V2, V3, there's that base of plant to infest anyway, right? Because they were going to get that fissure development. And I think the question we're asking is if we potentially create other cracks or crevices further up that plant? Does it allow even more in? And, and what is the, the impact on those plants? It's a great question. We have a little land roller 
uh, here at, at Nebraska that we could mess around with this a little bit. Um, I've never observed that in the field, but if, if there was more injury points to that plant, there's a potential uh, for, for more infestation on that plant. And it would, we would just need to look at it more closely to know um, I, others feel free to chime in if you, you want to add to that. Now, this is Bruce. Sometimes uh, we find uh, where we're finding detecting soybean gall midge on, is on field approaches where there'd be extra traffic from sprayers, that sort of thing. So it's possible there could be a relationship. There, there have been a couple comments about kind of general trends across the years with 2019 maybe being a heavier year and uh, 2020, 2021 being less intense, does that line up with uh, some observations in the different states? I'll, I'll go with Nebraska. Any, and I guess yeah. any idea of what might be driving that? I think it's too soon to know what drives it. You know, it'll take a number of years to understand it. You know, it, I, I appreciate that comment 2019 was was worse and I'm not sure where that individual's at that has those observations. I, I think for Nebraska, our worst year was 2020. Um, and that would be for some growers and not others. So it, I think it, it varies across the state each year on where pressure is, is uh, most prevalent. Um, but, but definitely in terms of the, the survey, um, 2020 was a, was a pretty bad year for Nebraska, but not for other states. Uh, so it's, it's not like the whole, you know, at least from my understanding, and please feel free to chime in, um, you know, uh, the other panelists, if, if, you know, with your observations. I think just to emphasize a point that you made where, you know, some of this, we just unfortunately don't have the answers yet. We don't have enough data yet to understand these year to year dynamics and what's driving it. Is it cold? Is it some of the production practices changing or what? Bob, do we have time for, for more questions or do we need to be moving along here? Oh, uh, we probably should move on. We'll try to respond to some of the questions in the Q and A uh, box and we'll have time at the end for other questions. So keep on putting your questions in the Q and A uh, chat. I think Justin was gonna present some more information. Maybe just briefly as Justin's pulling up his presentation, just to mention, yeah. I think we're gonna do some kind of a, an FAQ, frequently asked questions. You know, So any questions we don't address here today, we're not ignoring those. Um, we'll uh, try to get answers posted to those questions um, sometime after these events. All right, this is gonna be really brief because uh, I'm just gonna take a few slides to kind of set up. Uh, and I think this was even some of the questions that were asked, which is what is the distribution of this insect in, in a field? Um, and, and obviously that relates to, to management. So back to this slide that we were looking at in the previous talk, uh, a number of you over the last few years have, have said, okay, yeah, we, we see movement, we see injury and, and uh, larval presence in this adjacent field, but, but how far into that field are we actually seeing that? Um, and so uh, we, we did a study to address that. So Joanna Schroeder D'Souza was a research scholar in my lab this, this past summer and, and the whole lab, this was a very large effort. It was a lot of plots to look at, um, set up a study where we put uh, plots from the edge of the field uh, where that zero mark is all the way out to 510 feet uh, into the field and, and took a number of measurements to say, as they move into this year's soybean field, what is the frequency of those infested plants? What is the larval number per plant? Um, and and you know, going back to, to Mitchell Helton's scoring system that, that Aaron uh, and the group of us developed, uh, that area under the severity progress curve, you know, what does that look like? And, and then, and then yield, of course, over that distance. So hopefully this will frame some of the upcoming conversation. So um, I'm going to focus on larval abundance here on this graph. Uh, on the x-axis, you see distance from the edge of the field from zero to 500 feet. This is obviously this year's soybean field uh, adjacent to that overwintering source. And then larval number per plant uh, on, on the x-axis. And, and you see there's an equation there. You can look at the gradient or that, that uh, colored area around that equation is the rough response that we saw, the confidence around that equation. And you see that they're most abundant near the field edge here and things decline, but we can find larvae out at 500 feet. So it, don't, don't leave this talk yet because right now you might leave the impression that this insect is far more into the field as a problem than what, what it is. That's not the case. I think you're gonna find 
uh, as we move through this, this presentation. So that, that sample occurred uh, before we got any emergence from this year's soybean. So it's only, what we're looking at is only overwintering adult emergence and movement. And this, this next graph shows you after we complete a generation in this year's soybeans and they, they you know, move to new plants and infest uh, you know, in late July, um, you can see that, that numbers have gone up you know, this, this X or this Y axis is quite a bit larger than it was before. Uh, there's that more distinct gradient. Uh, obviously there's presence further out into the field. Things kind of flat line here, starting at about a hundred feet, they get, they get kind of lower and stay low on out into the field. And so that's, that's been larval number uh, out there. And then if we move to area under the severity progress curve, starting in June 28th till August uh, 21st, this is a really nice system because it tells you the, the seasonal impact of this, this insect in the system. Very well-defined uh, grouping of all those observations of, for, for each plot uh, where things really collapse at, a, at 100 feet. We, we see a pretty flat line here uh, on out into the field. You'll notice it's not right against the the x-axis, we do see some injury out there, but it, you know it's it's quite low uh, that that far out into the field. And then what you're all interested in is is you know the the yield and in, in terms of yield response. Um, and you could see that that things are definitely you know as as implied by the photo here, you know a, a lot of yield loss right along the, the field edge. And once we reach that about 100 foot mark, things start to level out. Um, and so this is the first year of this data. We, we don't want you to run away with this as an understanding. It's going to take a couple of years to sort this out. Uh, but, but clearly there's that gradient and loss within the first hundred feet. This should frame the area that we're most interested in, in terms of management. So larval presence at hundred feet, but you know, caution on that. They're out there. They're not really abundant compared to the field edge. Increase in larval abundance in, in the late sample in July. Um, you know, injury declined uh, with, with no change after the first 100 feet. It's kind of flat from there on out in the rest of the field. And that was pretty, pretty similar to the, the yield that we saw as well, where things really flatten out at 100 feet as well. So, um, you know, this, this field categorizes as moderate uh, to, to decent pressure out there uh, from the insect. And so the varying levels of pressure that we might see in fields would, would change that as well. And I believe I'll, I'll kick it back to, to Bob Wright and Bob Cook. Okay, if I got the agenda right, is Tom Hunt our next speaker? Okay, we'll shift gears a little bit and talk about insecticide management for soybean gall midge. Yep, I'm Tom Hunt, and I'm going to be talking about um, our insecticide studies that we've done with uh, uh, soybean gall midge the last few years. Um, I want to say at the outset, I'm going to be uh, one of several talks on insecticides and soybean gall midge, uh, both today and even next uh, session on next Tuesday, I believe. Um, I'm not going to be getting in depth into any of these studies. What I really want to do is kind of give you a survey or some, some examples of the type of studies being done, products being looked at, and frankly, show you some of the challenges that we've been having with these and kind of set it up for some of the following talks either today or, or uh, next week. Um, we'll look at seed treatments, uh, foliar, drop nozzle, and T-band application. And I say, also say at the outset that these are all out of, uh, uh, what I'm showing you today is all out of Justin's lab down around uh, Lincoln in that area. We see this graph a lot, but it's a good one. Uh, what we want to do with insecticides, if you look at this, we have on the left, the uh, yellow bars are where the adults are coming out of last year's beans, which are this year's soybean or this year's corn, and they're moving in across the road into this year's soybean, where you have the dark lines going up the graph, bars on the graph. And what we want to do, frankly, is deal with these, the behavior of these insects, the adults coming out of last year's beans, this year's corn. We either want to kill them, or we want to kill their offspring, the larvae that just get into the plants, or both. Now, of course, the first thing we would like to try, which is nice and easy and makes sense, are seed treatments. And this is just an example of some of the studies and, and types of seed treatments that we've looked at. This particular one is with gaucho, midocloprid, is done in Cass County, uh, planted May 6th. Two important things we always talk about and we found are important when we talk about insecticide management are the planting date, May 6th, and the duration, 35-day duration of adult emergence. In this case, we had four treatments, untreated, a fungicide only, gaucho at a grower rate and a higher rate of gaucho. If we look over here at larvae per six plants, we see for some reason, you know, the fungicide is significantly different higher 
There might be several reasons for that. We can talk about in the discussion later. But one thing, the important thing to point out is, look, we do see a significant effect in the large or the higher rate of gaucho. So that, that's promising. So let's look further. Um, we see that if we look at that um, plant injury scale we talked about, you know, cumulative throughout the season, checking several times throughout the season, on the left axis here, um, we see that the untreated and the fungicide are not significantly different, but we do see a difference in the gaucho treatment. But in this time, it is the lower rate of gaucho where we see less plant injury. I do want to point out that it is over at about maybe over 500 on the injury scale. And frankly, over about 300, you'll probably start to see some effects of the midge. And then if we look at me yield, however, we see something that we frequently see, no significant difference in yield for anything. Now, you know, sometimes we've seen some effects of yield uh, a little bit, but we have not seen any consistency when we're looking at these uh, seed treatments um, alone like this. So the next thing we look at is common to use our uh, foliar application of insecticide. And in this case, I'll show you kind of an extreme case and there'll be more discussion of it later, but here's where three times we'll hit this field to try to stop this, you know, address this 23 days of emergence. So in this case, I used three different insecticides um, at different times, and you'll see they mixed them up, you know, one time in Indigo V first, another time Warrior. And then they sprayed at V2, 12 days after this, and then 15 days after the second application. As you can see here, V2 is starts, the first spray is right here at the beginning stage. Now, if we look at plants, num a percent of plants infested, here's a pattern. We don't see anything, any significant difference. But when you're looking at just infested plants, you're not really looking at the intensity of the infestation. So when we do look at larvae per six plants, we see, okay, they pull out. These different, you know, untreated is significantly higher in number of larvae than either of these three regimens of treatments, three treatments per that emergence period. They're not separating apart from one another, but they are lower than the um, check. However, when we look at the plant injury, okay, they pull out again not significantly different from one another, but they are lower than the untreated. And then, but when we look at yield, um, we see, okay, there is some separation. We see some significantly higher yields with two of the regimens. However, I do also wanna point out that this significantly higher level of yield is about, what, 29 bushels? So this was probably a 55 or more bushel per acre potential field. So even though we did see an effect, we didn't see a strong effect like we'd like to see if it was a true management tactic. So what happens when we change um, application methods? Justin had noticed that drop nozzles, you know, protecting the base of the plant is very important. You can see here in the picture, he's got these nozzles down low, so he can really sat try to saturate that area down at and below the cotyledon. And so in this case, there are several studies he did, but this particular one, he's, we're just looking at leverage at 2.8 ounces per acre at 15 gallons per acre. Um, this was where we used a standard overhead application and then that drop nozzle application method. And at two days after the first emergence um, was when the application was, was done, 31 day emergence period. Then he looked at larvae numbers and uh, injury scores every 10 days. So looking at this again, plants infested, no significant difference here. However, when you go and look at the total larvae per six plants, well, we don't see any difference between the overhead and the untreated with respect to number of larvae, but we do see a significant difference, lower um, larvae per six plants for the drop nozzle. So that's promising. Um, let's go further and look at the injury score. Well, this also, all this does is the solid lines are a mid-season rating a cumulative rating, and then the bark hatched are a late season a cumulative rating. So you see in both cases, the untreated is higher than the insecticide treatments. However, in this case with the ratings, you don't see a difference between the overhead or the drop nozzle. And then when we go to yield, although you see it looks like, oh, there's a difference, well, not significant. There isn't a significant difference in yield. And again, even the highest yield here, mean yield here is at what? About 21, 22 bushel per acre. So again, you know, these fields were getting hammered by the midge and nothing was really, you know, pulled out, particularly when we looked at the real result, which was yield. So how about if we combine some things? Um, here's a study where Portenza was and cruiser and uh, drop nozzle with two treatments of insecticide was looked at. It was kind of a complex design, a split pot design where they used these seed treatments, um, a fungicide seed treatment, cruiser vibrance, 
at a normal rate, Cruiser Max Vibrance at a higher rate, Fortenza alone, and then Fortenza plus Cruiser Max at some lower rates. And then over these, they either left it a cruise uh, C treatment only or added to insecticide treatments, foliar, indigo or warrior, and they flip flop this. This was planted at May 6th and um, uh, the first emergence was June 4th. And this was one of those long 41 day emergence sites. I hate to see that. If we look overall, and I'm not gonna dwell into these too much, but overall, if we look at drop nozzles, plants infested, no significant difference. That's kind of been a pattern looking at percent plants infested. But when we look at larvae for six plants, in general, for most of these, either within the different seed treatments like fungicide, Cruiser Max, Cruiser Max at a high rate, uh, Fortenza or Fortenza and Cruiser Max, we don't see within group very often any significant difference or across groups much difference, except we do see a difference here with the Cruiser Max vibrance at a high rate, where we see lower larvae per six plants. So, okay, there's something, let's follow that through. Looking at plant injury again on the left, if we look at the drop nozzle effect only, we see, yes, there was an effect, lower injury when we're using the drop nozzle insecticide on these fungicides or on these seed treatments. But when we look at the plant injury um, across the seed treatments effect only, we do not see a, a significant difference there either. So um, let's look at a little further at yield, which we finally always want to look at. And we see, okay, with just uh, looking at the drop nozzle effect broadly, we see that yes, there's an effect. Um, significant effect, higher yield with the insecticide treatment on top of those seed treatments. Um, and look, we're getting up there towards 68 bushel, so that's decent yield. However, when we look at the yield at the, uh, uh, the, the treated versus un untreated foliar within these seed treatments, we don't see a whole lot of differences here with the uh, Cruiser Max at the high level where we had a difference before, we see no significant difference within the group or even across. We do see a difference here with uh, Fortenza, the just Fortenza only versus Fortenza with a uh, insecticide treatments over the top, but we really don't see the type of effects we wanna see or the patterns that we wanna see. So again, let's switch to another tactic. This is something that we've used in the past, um, T-band incorporated at plant. So um, here we're using granules, we're looking at thymet in this case. Here is a planting date of May 12th. Here we have uh, the gray is the untreated and then the different levels of thymet up to nine ounces per thousand feet for the dark one. Here again, at the frequency of infested plants, no significant difference. However, when we look at average larvae per plant, we see, yes, there's a significant difference uh, with the thymet treatments, not separating out amongst themselves, but there's a difference, lower um, number of larvae. And then when we look at yield, we see a significant difference here, all the way up to the uh, high rate. So of course, this rate, if you look across here, is only about 40 bushels per acre, but we are seeing a significant effect, particularly with respect to the um, untreated check. And if we have a totally different study in another field, different planting date, May 3rd, we see a similar study here. For once, we see a difference in frequency of infested plants from uh, the untreated down to the high level of uh, thymet. Then we, don't, we, see a we see a difference here between the untreated and the high level of thymet. And then again, in the yield, we also see a difference between the untreated and a high level of uh, thymet here. Again, and this is getting up there towards 60 bushel per acre. So in this case, we got some good protection. But I will say it, it bounces around here um, in some of the other studies where they were looking at seed treatments, foliars, or in furrow or T-band uh, thymet. Um, uh, we just don't get the consistency we'd like to see. And when we do see an effect, sometimes and often, it's not a really strong effect and doesn't really keep you close to your yield potential. So what are the conclusions to this? Well, to date, we found no consistent standalone insecticide application satisfactorily protects yield from soybean gall midge. You know, some things pop out once in a while, but the consistency isn't there, nor are we really protecting that anywhere near the yield potential of the given fields. And then the drop nozzle, but we do see some promising things. Um, and so drop nozzle application, at plant insecticide, seed treatment, alone in combination might be useful in an integrated approach um, when we further understand the behavior of this insect in the agro system and ag environment. Also, depending on risk, how many you're gonna have or not. So basically we have to look at this closer. Um, that's what some of the other studies will do to look at other factors involved when inducing some of these techniques. And uh, you'll be seeing that later on. Now, one of the questions I've gotten is why, okay, why 
All these other insect pests of soybeans we manage with insecticides somehow, why not with soybean gall midge? And I'll say, well, that's somewhat true, but really there's other insects that are hard to treat with insecticides and manage. And they share some characteristics with the soybean gall midge. One is Dectes stem borer. Some of you are familiar with that. Those in Kansas, Southern Nebraska, Missouri, this is an insect that uh, the adult comes out over a long period of time, extended period of time, similar to soybean gall midge. The oviposition occurs over extended period of time, similar to the soybean gall midge, and the larvae are in the stem. And this insect was first noticed in beans in like 1968, and we still don't have a slam dunk insecticide strategy to deal with it. So insects with these characteristics of long emergence, long oviposition period, and in the stem are just very hard to deal with, um, but we're working on it, and we do see some promising things that you'll be, people will be talking about in further and continued talks later today and next week. So that's my portion as kind of an introduction for Vilma and Bruce and some others later on. So with that, I'm done. Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is uh, Vilma Montenegro. I am a master's student in Nebraska. I've been working for a little over two years in soybean gold midge and one of the studies I'm leading is an insecticide timing trial. So um, this study was, let me find how to change the slides. There we go. Um, this study was done with the objective to evaluate three different insecticide products that we were applying only once at different times uh, based on the very first adult detection of soybean gold midge. So we had an organophosphate that was dimethyl LB4, that it, there was a pyrethroid hero in the neonicotinoid belay. And um, this experiment was conducted in eastern Nebraska in Saunders County. It was a field that is um, near Memphis. And it was conducted over 2020 and 2021. But today, because of time, I'm just going to focus on my results from 2021. Uh, the, Plots were arranged as a randomized complete block design with four replications. So basically this is how it looks like. In the field, we have a, a field that is the last year soybean and this, this will be the current year uh, soybean. So basically each of these columns will be, each of these columns will be um, one replication and each treatment will be fine once um, in each of those uh, replications. So for example, yellow, uh, will be one in um, in our first rep, and then um, once in our second rep, th third and fourth. Uh, we had a total of 10 and 11 treatments. We had 10 in 2020, and then in 2021, we added an extra treatment, um, and all that included uh, one untreated, so a control. Uh, this table represents the treatments that we were applying. Again, we had these three products, Dimetoid, Hero, and Belay. Those were foliars. And this is the product that we added in 2021 that you already saw some results in uh, with Timeth. So it, it was promising from the results from 2020. So it, this was added for the, next, the following year. And um, so all our foliars were applied with a three uh, point mountain sprayer at exception of our um, granular, which is Timeth 20G that was applied as a T-band at planting. And as I mentioned, there were different timings of application. So you see here zero, five, and 10 days. Uh, those times are relative to the very first time that adults were detected. So zero days means um, an application that was made the same day as we detected emergence, and then one five days later and another 10 days later. And uh, for the evaluations, I'm not gonna go into much detail because basically all of our insecticide trials are evaluated in a very similar way. But what we took into account to measure the efficacy was uh, infestation and larvae count, which was done two times in the season, 15 and 38 days after the very first adult detection. So basically we had an evaluation in June and then another one in July. And then plant injury, that was what Dr. Hudson was talking about. So there is this uh, injury scale that we use to measure the percentage of plants that are either uh, wilted or dead in the, in the field. Uh, we were doing these evaluations weekly from the first time we detected adults until um, close to maturity, so the R7 stage of growth. And then this specific field was harvested in October 4th, so that's when we took yield. Um, enough for the results, I just want you to get familiar with these type of graphs because that's how I'm presenting the results. So in the x-axis, we're going to see all of the treatments and then in the y-axis, I have um, this 
weird looking numbers that don't make a whole lot of sense. Um, they are either, they have been transformed into logit or natural log, but you can always go to your right and you'll see the actual value. So the real numbers that were taken in the field. Okay, so let's look at this. First, um, I have infestation for June, which was our first evaluation. Again, we have the treatments in the x-axis and here we have the proportion of infested plants. So what we see is first, we make a comparison um, within the product and between the different timings. So in Hero, for example, we see that there were no significant differences between the different times of application. So that's what the NS mean. And we see that there are no differences between timings of application for any of those products. But then we are comparing an overall um, differences of the product. So we're comparing um, the overall response of Hero against Belay, Dimetoy, the untreated, and Timeth. And we see that we have different letters, which means that there were significant differences. And we saw that Hero had a lower proportion of infested plants in comparison to the untreated. So to those plots that didn't receive any treatment. Uh, but then in July, in our second evaluation, we did not see any significant differences within uh, timings of application between products. You see that it's all NS. And the same when we were comparing uh, products against each other, there were no differences in that late evaluation. Uh, then for larvae count, our evaluation in June, we see that there were some differences over here. We have different letters in Hero. So the very first application that was done the same day as emergence occurred had a lower number of total larva in comparison to the other two timings. But um, that was the only one. The other products, you see there are no differences. But then when we compare the overall effect of the products, we see that Hero, again, had a lower um, number of total larva in comparison to the untreated and actually belay. Um, okay, let's see in July. So again, in our late evaluation, when we were counting the number of larva, we did not see any differences um, either within the timings of application between the products or between uh, products. So basically, in our evaluations in June, we are seeing some differences, but then uh, later in the season in July, we did not see uh, any differences at all. And uh, finally, the plant injury, this is focused on the final injury that we observed. And we did not see any significant differences uh, between timings of application, but um, in the overall product evaluation, we see that Hero right here and the time F, uh, 20G, they both had a lower plant injury in comparison to untreated plots. So basically so far I've shown you a couple of differences that we found during this study, but I want to, I want you to pay attention here. So this is the yield for both years. I'm showing um, you also 2020. And we see that there were no significant differences in yield, either between the timings of application or between products, just no differences in yield. Um, so as a summary from this uh, study, there are no treatment that has provided consistent control of soybean gold mitch in both years. This taking into account 2020 and 2021. Also here in, 20, in June of 2021, showed that there was lower infestation, lower larva uh, numbers in, compar in comparison to the control, so to the untreated. Also, we saw that plant injury in 2021 was lower in HERO and in time F in comparison to the control. But regardless of all these little differences that we observed during the uh, season, there was no impact in yield. Um, and yeah, that's all I have to show you for this presentation. And I'll be happy to take questions if we have some time. Yeah, I don't see any open questions in the Q&A chat box. Uh, so as you have questions, put them in the Q&A chat box. We'll probably have time at the end here. We should have plenty of time at the end to have some extended discussion on some of these topics. But our next speaker is uh, Bruce Potter at the University of Minnesota, who's going to explain to us what it all means. Well, hello, and, uh, and the last, uh, last speaker here. So I'll try to make sure we have plenty of time for questions at the end. And uh, sometimes doing nothing is, is the right approach to things. And 
and, and it might be the case in case in, in regards to foliar insecticides and in soybean gall midge. Uh, doing nothing is act actually an active strategy, and it's a little more difficult for some people than others. But uh, there's reasons. There's reasons to just uh, stand by and and uh, let things progress. Um, you know, if it wasn't for the yield impact, uh, soybean gall midge would just be another cute little fly with some obnoxious orange larvae. But but there are some pretty significant yield impacts, and in Minnesota, we're not nearly as heavily infested as that infested as Nebraska is or, or, or some other areas. But the wilting, uh, plant death, uh, stem breakage do impact yield, and sympt uh, symptoms can go from not detected to just a few plants uh, here and there on the edge of the field uh, to entire field edges dead, and then finally to uh, damage progressing further into the field. So. It kind of depends on where you're at as far as uh, as far as how how uh, how impactful your gall midge population is. I uh, want to point out that just because you can find gall midge doesn't mean that uh, that it's an economic issue. Minnesota, we've got actually very very few fields that at this point are are economic. Uh, that could change. This is just some fields that we checked for gall midge in 2021, some part of a standard survey funded by the North Central Soybean Research Program. And then also we got some assistance from extension educators. Um, the yellow bars are where we had symptoms, but the timing was right or it was something else. So they weren't confirmed. The red bars are where we have gall midge. And the one thing to point out is even where you have gall midge, neighboring fields may be, may be just fine in these lower infested areas like we have in Minnesota. All right, we've spent a lot of time talking about, uh, you know, controlling gall midge with insecticides. Um, the problem with the larvae, it's kind of like corn borers, some other insects, once they're, once they're in the stem, they're, they're fairly protected from insecticide. Um, so it's hard to get at them with a direct application. Uh, some, a lot of the efforts have been focused to the adults and trying to manage adult populations, try to prevent those, uh, those uh, infestations from establishing in this year's soybeans. Uh, this is uh, some emergence data out of Minnesota. We've got three years here and, and uh, it kind of point, uh, points out the overwintering populations coming out of last year's soybeans and then some flights in this year's soybeans. Uh, this is the one where we're really trying to manage, uh, but the problem one of the problems we have is if this overwintering generation isn't well controlled, um, you still have larvae to infest plants later in the season. I pulled some treatments out of a 2020 study, and uh, uh, what I've got superimposed is when there's adult activity, uh, those are those little bars with the arrows on the end of them, and I've got several treatments here we've got no insecticide, which is a uh, uh, black bar. And then we've got uh, a product that's not labeled and it's not gonna get labeled evidently. But we've got uh, a mix of two insecticides uh, at different timings. So the first timing is uh, June 9th, and that's about four days before we caught the adult emergence. We targeted at a growth stage, so it would have been V2. The second timing is the 19th, and that we've had our first adult capture in this field on the 15th, so that's about four days after emergence. And these, then we had some sequential applications. So we followed that early application uh, with, a, with a later application and at, on, on a 22nd, and uh, that timing that ended up about four days after first detection uh, with another application towards the end of the flight. So what we have on the y-axis is uh, plants dying or dead, and these are in percentages. They're not in the uh, in the, uh, this is the score. And you can kind of see what happens uh, with some of these treatments. So this dotted line here is a treatment um, before emergence, and we're getting some control. Uh, but adult emergence, we're getting some control, but it's uh, it's not as good as some of the others. We're probably missing uh, uh, some of that later, later uh, adult emergence and egg laying. And then if we get into uh, um, 
on the sequential application, we pick up a little bit at the end. Um, we've got a hero right here that's in some of the other treatments. That was timed uh, as close as we could to adult emergence. It happened four days later. And we've got some control. And then finally, we've got uh, treatment uh, four days after adult emergence and then a sequential. Uh, so we have a treatment on the 19th of June and then, and then uh, 17 days later on the 2nd of July. That seems to, to uh, do a little bit more, but what you can see is once we start to get that second generation of, uh, of adults or that summer generation of adults and soybeans produced, that damage continues to go up. Uh, the worst treatments are close to 100% um, mortality by the end of the season. And, and even our best uh, treatment uh, is uh, almost, is over 80% of those plants had, had died. So what does that really look like in real time? Uh, here's July 17th and these slides are all set up in the same way. The slide on the left is no insecticide. I picked one, I picked one of the middle treatments out, Hero in the middle. And then our, our uh, uh, double application uh, right after emer adult emergence was detected and um, in a sequential on the, on, in early July. You can start to see a little damage. The other two treatments look pretty good. And if you look over at that corn on the left side, upper left, that's uh, last year's soybeans. And you can see quite a bit more damage right up against that corn. A couple of weeks later, we've got damage in all the treatments. The damage continues to progress in uh, early August, in the middle of August early September and at harvest. And even our best treatment, it looks like uh, there's quite a bit of large live tissue in there, but actually if you look close, those are just individual live plants and there's a lot of dead plants in underneath that can. So what does that look like in yield? Um, well, if we look at our best treatment and that's uh, experiment, uh, labeled experiment one plus two and the BND timing. That's significantly better than uh, doing nothing. All the treatments are uh, statistically equivalent. But here's the problem. We've sprayed these fields twice. Um, and as far as uh, foliar products go, pretty, uh, pretty good performing relative, uh, relatively on gall midge. But if we're only managing about 16 bushels with our best treatment, um, that's probably not good enough. And really, you're uh, just spending a lot of money to collect crop insurance. All right. If you're out in the field, uh, we're, we're after gall midge right now. But there's a lot of, uh, a lot of insects out there that aren't gall midge. Some are pests, but a lot of them are beneficial. And of course, if you're spraying a broad spectrum of insecticide, like most of these that we've talked uh, you're going to take these beneficials out. And a little later, uh, we're going we're to have some uh, talks on, on uh, a talk on some of these beneficials that may be impacting soybean gall midge. So again, anytime you, you put a broad spectrum insecticide out there, you're disrupting a system and you're actually removing some natural controls. So whether or not we've got beneficials affecting gall midge, there's other insects out there, um, and you're putting an insecticide application on that field. Uh, Minnesota soybean aphid is still our primary pest. And we do have a, a pretty high frequency of perethroid insect uh, resistant, uh, perethroid ins insecticide resistant uh, soybean aphids in our populations here. Every time you put a perethroid insecticide on, you're, you're exacerbating that uh, resistance. You've removed predators and parasites, and, and you can cause some real problems that way. Another problem we've got this year, we had a dry year. We had a lot of problems with spider mites. And again, you can flare those spider mite populations. And, and also, um, if you are spraying an insect, you are spraying, uh, selecting for resistance in that field. All right. so. When's doing nothing the right choice? First off, if you've got a low potential for yield impact, if you don't have uh, a significant gall midge pressure in that field or in, in your field neighboring fields, um, 
I would just kind of leave them alone. Um, we've got a damaging stage that's got low exposure to the insecticide. One thing I did mention is that even the translocated insecticides, uh, the group fours, for example, like the neonics will move up. Uh, one of those experimentals we had in there because there's potential it could move both ways in the plant, but even that was not enough to get that um, insect uh, controlled at the base of the plant. Um, we've got this problem with these long adult emergence periods, and then we've got multiple generations uh, to continue damage after, after your first application. And, and our foliar insecticides just don't have that kind of residual to, to manage a three-week uh, insect, insect window. And, and especially if you get later in the season, and this isn't probably the stages we're going after, but you can almost have a constant adult flight. And uh, for the guys that are familiar with dealing with corn borers where you've got univoltine and multivoltine corn borer, you can kind of end up with almost constant insect flight at the end of the year. And then finally, probably as, more, as important as anything is those applications can aggravate other problems. Um, you can flare pest problems by removing the beneficials and you're always selecting for insecticide resistance when you put an application on that field. So that's what I've got. And uh, if, I've got, if we've got time, I'm, if there's any questions, otherwise we can get into a general discussion on questions. Let's see what's in the Q&A box. If we have some time, there, there have been a few questions related to insecticides, but focused on treating the soil, I think to knock down the populations in year one, to keep them from moving to the adjacent soybean in year two. Any, any thoughts about that, you know, an, an application of an insecticide, or I think someone mentioned like a fumigation kind of an approach. We've tried that with growers in East Central Nebraska at a few locations, uh, lower span before it was gone. And, and the trouble, we, we, did, we caught adults regardless of treated or untreated, and those were spring applications on last year's soybean field. And so we were attempting to get them in the spring prior to emergence, but they emerged in all treatments. Um, the, the issue one issue is that we can catch, we may be able to catch adults. They may emerge, they may have come into contact with an insecticide upon emergence, but we may still get them in the jars. They may be able to make it their way up and be counted. Um, and so I don't know if our methodology is that good uh, to, to do that type of work, but uh, we're, we're, we're catching them regardless of treatment. Um, and that, that was maybe two site years of data, not a ton. Uh, do others have information to contribute on that? We, we've not tested a lot of chemistries though either. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Justin. Um, another topic that came up a few times in the questions after hearing about the biology of the pest is the potential for a, a trap crop, right? So considering the, the phenology, the host range, uh, movement, you know, could, could we try some kind of a, a trap crop to catch these things and kill them off before they get into a soybean field? Bruce, I know you brought this up early on in conversation. Maybe you want to kick us off with, with your thoughts on it. Well, I don't know. I don't know if it'll work. It, the problem you've got is, you know, that long, that long emergence. Um, you know, one of the things that, you know, we've talked about a little bit or, you know, I've talked to some growers and consultants with and tossed around is maybe planting some soybeans intercropping some soybeans with the corn, let those get colonized in last year's soybean fields, and then knock those, knock those populations out once they're infested. Um, the problem is they don't all stay in that field and they'll move. Um, you know, and, and I, I'm not sure maybe where these infestations are real bad. Um, maybe your soybean border is a trap crop and you end up taking that out and then replanting it later. And, uh, and, and, and lowering the populations, but um, I don't know. It, it's not been tested. It, it's kind of an interesting concept, but I don't know if it'll work, Justin. It'll, it'd be interesting. This is Tom Hunt. It'd be interesting to look at. I mean, trap crops, you'd kind of want to trap crop something that was very much, you know, very much more attractive than say the, the main part of the beans. 
which could be a plant that was, you know, which we don't really see much in, in with the soybean gall midge other than say sweet clover, uh, which, and will it go to that instead of beans? I don't know. Or maybe a different stage, you know, an earlier planted, you know, an earlier planted soybean. Um, if you could, you know, plant margins that way. I used to see that with bean leaf beetle up here in Northeast where guys would plant beans early um, around the borders and then go back and spray those bean leaf beetles in those border areas because they'd be attracted to those uh, beans. But uh, it's, it's something to look at, but we'd have to have something that would be really differentially attractive to those uh, soybean gall midge. I know with that other insect I talked about, Decti stem borer, you know, they've done work and with uh, planting uh, uh, commercial soybean or sunflowers around the edges of the uh, soybean fields. And that does seem to attract them because, but the Dectes preferentially goes to commercial sunflower rather than soybeans if it's around. So you do need that difference of attraction to really make it work. So um, it'd be interesting to try, you know, particularly around the borders to see if something like that might be feasible. It might be a little work intensive though. The, the, the problem I see with that, Tom, is still it's, is so we spray it and then we're not getting real good control. Um, so, you know, yeah, I mean, that, I, that's what I, but if, spraying but it if probably you had, wouldn't work. But if you had some sacri sacrificial early planted soybeans, um, and then you just were acknowledging you were going to tear those up and, and uh, replant them later on, I'm not sure that might be an option too. As long as you're not, you know, these are edge infestations and you're only trying to not, to deal with that worst part of the soybean field. You know, yeah, I don't, I don't think spraying them would be the answer, but destroying them or, you know, <laughs> would probably be something you'd have to do. With, with the sunflower soybean thing, they stay in the soybeans, but with the beans, they're not gonna if you leave them there. Um, yeah. And you're right, spraying wouldn't be, at least at this point, chemical tree doesn't seem to be able to take care of them well enough, but you'd have to grind them down and replant and hope that that works. Uh, one one potential issue we face with trap cropping is, you know, or trying to, to trap these is that their long duration of emergence, when do we kill soybean? you know, where they haven't completed development and fallen off and already pupated and are ready to emerge. And that, that's a, that timing is a challenging thing. So that'd almost be part of those experiments just to figure out when, yeah. um, when to do it. Yeah, well, like I yeah. said, work intensive just to figure it out, let alone do it. Mm -hmm. And we don't really have the, probably the ideal method for timing adult emergence worked out either yet. So uh, these emergence cages aren't by any means perfect. No. But let me jump in, jump in and mention the QR code on the screen. If you want to get CCA credits, this is one option. We previously had posted a link in the chat box if you can, for an online site as well. So uh, there's two options to get uh, CCA credits. I think another question that might generate some discussion, has plant population been considered the idea of using maybe high populations uh, to divide the infestation or lower populations that might encourage larger uh, stems that would be better able to survive feeding damage. Any strategies on uh, site-specific plant populations? I have a few observations from Nebraska. We, we had a grower, fortunately or unfortunately, fortunately for us, unfortunately for him, plant population around 600,000 plants per acre. So that's way up there, almost as an inadvertent test to this fissure development occur on high populations. And it, it occurred on those plants. So I guess the answer part of that, we can't stop fissure development, it appears, at least with one variety, by, by really inordinately high populations. That's not even economically feasible to do. Um, Natasha Umezu is a graduate student here in, at UNL. She's started looking at stem diameter and population. It appears there's a relationship as we increase stem diameter, we increase population on plant. Don't think anybody's surprised by that. Um, so the, the question would be like larval, larval number per unit area, right? If you, if you increase that population, there's less larvae per plant. Is that equivalent to the number of larvae under a lower plant population with more larvae in a single plant, um, but survivability, which I think is the, the applied use product part of that, um, you know, of that plant is a, is a question we haven't answered yet. At least I haven't, or our lab hasn't tried to here. Um, good, it's a good question. 
I, that's that's my take for the rest of the group to add to add to. Another question that came up, and it might be expected with some of the small plot research that's going on for this being, you know, a new pest, is uh, you know the issue of statistical differences in yield, and uh, you know the economics for those yield differences. When do you want to touch on that? You know, I think that comes up quite a bit when well, we do small plot work. Yeah, I saw one place where you know, small plot work is always an issue, particularly with a plant that moves around quite a bit. And so some of the effects, you know, some things can get swamped out or some things can get aggravated. Um, you know, it comes, uh, you know, some of these plants, if you have better looking plants, it might be more attractive um, to the bogalamage. And when you have these small plots, insects can select among plots somewhat. They're small and it might be different in large plots or in field levels. But back to the statistical difference, you know, there were some of those slides that showed a, a numerical difference, but not a statistical difference. And if there isn't a statistical difference, you can't really attribute that difference to the effect of, say, the, the insecticide or the treatment using. It might just be chance. So we really don't uh, uh, can't say that, you know, when there's a numerical difference, if you do a lot of studies and you'd always see that numerical difference, well, then maybe there's something there. But in a study, you know, in these studies we've done so far over a couple of years, I, you know, they, they could be a chance. You can't rely on that as being real attributed to the treatment that you use. The other thing is when we have seen, at least when I've seen some statistical differences in yield, if similar studies like that maybe Aaron or Justin or somebody else might have done, don't show a difference, or I've done, don't show a difference the next year. So, you know, we want to see consistency before we can say that, yeah, you're, if you use this treatment, you're going to get a five or 10 bushel difference, you know, increase, or you're going to save five or 10 bushels on a year. We need to see that consistently. And that's the thing I haven't really seen much yet, except, you, you know, somewhat, I think we were seeing that initially with Thymet, but then Justin saw some, had some studies where I don't think that came out. So the consistency wasn't there. And heck, if the place where you're really seeing the effect with thymate, you're spending, what is it, about $40 an acre for that? So, uh, yeah, I agree. You know, if we can consistently prove some yield benefit, um, you know, we can start talking about it more. But right now, it just hasn't been consistent. And like I said, the numerical differences without statistical um, separation really, you know, what does that mean? doesn't mean that the treatment is really working. It just means it could be chance. Uh I don't have much to add to Tom's because I think Tom covered that really well. I, the only thing I would say to, to those that are like, well, okay, you're telling us there's not a lot, you know, in front of us right now that that's consistent. I think, I think we just need to open up our toolbox to, to a lot of other strategies and, you know, and look at cultural control strategies and maybe combinations of things. So that's, that's a good reason to come to the next session is, is not to have this toolbox just sit on insecticides, which don't appear to be consistent, but, but look at all the other strategies that, that may be, um, you know, working. Yeah, because if, if you've seen, there's several different um, factors affecting the behavior of this insect, like, you know, when it's moving, coming out of the ground, what stage, when the plants are emerging, what stage the plants are, when the adults are emerging. And so, you know, so far we've gotten, there's been some studies that show some hints that, okay, if we go this direction, maybe maybe we can increase uh, effectivity or maybe we can start be developing a, an integrated plan, but we have to look at those, those all those variables. And, and when you have several variables to look at, it gets to be quite complex. And, um, you know, I think one thing I looked at this year was, uh, uh, you know, that thymet in furrow, we were saying, well, what about just spraying the edge or treating the edge? And so we had 200 foot plots, 24 rows of thymet applied. Um, and uh, we saw some effects on the, uh, of course, the larval number and um, infestation and the, the injury rating. However, it was one of those times where it's in a field where the yields were all within like a bushel of one another, and they were matching the historical potential for that field. So what can you say about, about it then? Yeah, we saw the effect if it would have been higher yield and we see some yield effects, well, then we might be leading towards some kind of effect. So we still, you know, there's still more things to look at, but with the number of different methods to deal with it, to try to deal with it, whether it's seed treatment, drop nozzle, whatever, combined with planting date, you know, what are the beans at when they're coming out? You know, I, I think uh, we're, 
we're moving in the right direction. We just are not there yet. It's 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 just going to be a complex thing. And like I said, DECTES, there's you know that's been around for more than fifty years, and they're still not a not a slam dunk really good manage uh, insecticide management strategy for that. So we're still working, and hopefully something will come out. Give you guys relief. Well, Talk a long I time. think I think Tom said on this, but I think it's worth reinforcing is that. Um, you know, even for entomologists, this is an unusual situation. For example, soybean aphids, when those first came on the, on the scene, it was like, well, which insecticides work? And, and you know, that's our big hammer. And it actually kind of kind of limited IPM to a certain extent because it was an easy fix. And it, there's no easy fix with this insect because of its behavior and its biology, um, where it's at in the stem. And, and uh so this, this is actually, I always like to say for soybean gall midge, this is an insect that might make, force us to use IPM whether we want to or not. And I will add, there'll be more information coming. This is the first uh, session. Next session, we'll have some interesting, uh, so you know, stay tuned for next week on Tuesday because we'll explore it more. And I'm pretty sure there'll be more questions stemming from that, thinking about some of the insecticide things and what's gonna be presented later. So uh, uh, combinations. Food. It's not going to be a repeat of this. It's going to be more information. Yes, yeah, so, you know. So I was just going to mention the webinar next Tuesday is going to focus on cultural, biological, and host plant resistance tactics. The same time, 10 a.m. If you go back to the University of Minnesota registration site, you can register for that uh, session if you haven't already. Um, and. Yep. You know, one one conversation we've had as a group uh, in in over the past year or two is, is categorizing growers and their problem, mm -hmm. and whether or not you need to be in an area to respond. There there are probably a large majority that are either working with growers or are a grower that that do not need to consider these strategies at at the moment. Uh, so so it's that I and Bruce covered this really well in his talk. You've had a problem. You're continuing to have a problem. You're planting into, into a field adjacent to one that had a problem the previous year. You know, in, in the likelihood of, of having an issue is, is high. That's where these strategies start to pile in uh, because, you know, cultural control strategies like planting date have an agronomic cost just in terms of yield and making that decision that, that a lot of us don't want to make. But, you know, in, in the next session, Natasha, who's done a lot of work on that and I'll hide some, highlight some other stuff. That's a pretty effective strategy, but it's not appealing for the agronomy side of things. Uh, but maybe it's combination with some of the things we even discussed today, as Tom brought up, might be ways to bridge that gap in the future. So yeah, I just, I'm, I'm kind of thinking. Right. Oh, I'm kind of thinking there's, you know, there's different levels. You know, there's the risk level that I would say is low. You have them, but no big deal. It seems to be that way. Don't do anything. Maybe. But, and then there's there may be different strategies we develop depending on kind of the risk and the intensity. Cause you know, for quite, there's some people that talk about it some consultants I know that talk about it being an edge issue still where, you know, they have a, they get hit on the edge uh, 15, 20 bushel, but then it really peels off to, you know, be pretty normal, pretty quick. And they, they haven't been, you know, had devastating, you know, zero loss for hundred feet and things like that. And then there are areas like over by Wakefield these days, and you know, down by you know Justin, thank God, where they're getting hammered hard, and so the strategies might be totally different with that type of region and area, and you know, so we just have we have to see how that shakes out if we can kind of have a if you can come to expect well we're in a zone where we have it, but it's never it's not become you know this uh, uh, train wreck versus areas where this can become a train wreck and has been for the last couple of years. So uh, I, I wouldn't be too surprised if we have a mix of strategies and like, you know, Bruce had bought, brought up before, maybe Bob, I can't remember, you know, have kind of a checklist of factors to help you determine risk and not only risk, but what types of strategies you might use. You know, one thing that makes me excited is to see that 170 people have stayed on here for this conversation and down to about 150 now, but uh, that's, that's hopeful for all of us that we're, we're kind of invested in the, the complex future this insect can hold for us in terms of management. So I uh, appreciate all of you sticking around. Um, and and we, we, we greatly appreciate all the questions.
And I think it was mentioned that we'll we'll do like a Q and A. Bob Bob Cook mentioned that in in writing. That would be useful for all of you. Or an FAQ is what he mentioned. <laughs> FAQ, yeah, there you go. Wrong, wrong acronym. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah, thanks. I think we've touched on all the the questions that have come through either in the discussions here or in the Q and A toolbox where you can see the responses. Um, any other thoughts or comments from, from the panelists? I would just say if, if somebody came across something or after this session, they're sitting down for lunch and they're like, hey, I didn't think of this and now I have this question, please, please send that to us. We're gonna meet in a week. That's a good chance for us to bring that up. So um, hopefully we'll have more time for dialogue next week and discussion. Um, but, but we would encourage you to keep asking those questions um, for, for all of us to, to, to have a good conversation. And there's a question in the chat, was this recorded? So the recording will be posted uh, later. Somebody missed the uh, start of the meeting. I think, I think one more thing to point out is we appreciate all the, que the questions that people sent in ahead of time. Okay. We considered those seriously and putting together these talks to try to um, do what we could to address those questions. Um, you know, so like Bob was saying, if there are any other questions, you know, on the top of your head, send those along. We can see if we can address them in the upcoming presentations. Yep, and, and uh, I'd like to echo uh, uh, all the interest from the audience. And, and uh, you know, I think, I think one thing that's really important to remember is that, is that different areas have completely different populations of this insect. You know, Minnesota right now is fairly low. We can find it, you know, it might be statewide, you know, and it's just at, at low levels. Um, Will it stay that way? I don't know. I mean, we don't know. And that's that's kind of one of the issues working with the new insect is, is every year something new pops up and we see a new wrinkle. We'll keep at it. Quick question came through about acephate. Ah. Any of you included that in your efficacy trials? T tested a lot of stuff, not that one. <laughs> <laughs> so they mentioned the idea of a systemic insecticide. Right, you know, so if these insect, you you know, on the surface think that those systemics might have a better chance at controlling an insect in the plants. Any idea why we're not seeing that? Probably the location of the plant and the, yeah. the translocation of those products, um, where they stay, where they accumulate, has mm -hmm. a big, uh, uh, is a big reason why we're not seeing that with uh, the soybean gall midge, which just gets up near the epidermis at the very base of the plant. And, and Justin knows a little bit more about the actual feeding, I believe, of the larvae, which, which, where are they feeding? And because, you know, when I've tested those little soybean plants, like for the neonics, you know, you see, you see by V3, by V late V2, V3, you see a lot of accumulation in the leaves, you know, and it accumulates there. So it's not, they're not getting the same tighter as, as they would be in the leaves where you're really nailing those bean leaf beetles and having lethal or sublethal effects on some aphids and some other insects. So that's one thing, just where it's located inside that plant and where it's actually feeding and what it's feeding on. It's not acquiring the level that we'd like it to fit. And then I think you in Minnesota have seen, you know, some of those, if it's a seed treatment insect uh, 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 systemic, you know, they like with, uh, you know, acute toxicity peters out around B3 for several right. insects. So um, that's the other thing. Uh, with those types of systemics. So it kind of depends on the type of systemic, where it goes in the plant and where it ends up and where the insect is when it's feeding on that. And I don't know if we really know that much about the, the actual susceptibility of, of soybean gall midge to the different products. I mean, we're testing it, but we don't know, you know, what concentration is needed to actually kill the insect. So um, that might be part of it too. Mm -hmm. That's an excellent point, Bruce, that, you know, we don't, we don't have that direct information. Everything's indirect in the field. Um, they, the other complication not with, working hard enough, Justin. I think the other thing that's, that's strange about soybean gummage is all the decaying tissue around where it feeds. You know, there's, there's a lot of decay and breakdown of material and one wonders how that might influence some of the uptake of some of these chemistries if larvae was the target, um, you know, for, for some of that. And when, when you do get 
you know, with a lot of these fun with uh, midges, they do feed on necrotic tissue. So does this, if you are got a disease or are you having necrotic tissue, is it switching back and forth? I mean, you know, so, so yeah, there's, there's a lot of unknowns. Well, I would, I would think that's a pretty good point though, is that there's no, there's not going to be much translocation in dead tissue. I mean, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. And we, we couldn't even cover everything with two hours. Uh, so there's there's other studies on plant disease and and gallmage uh, that's been going on for oh this is the third year coming in Nebraska we find a lot of diseases with this thing uh, you know the the interaction and whether or not they cause more problems together is not yet known uh, but uh, but we have Gary Ewan as plant pathologist and and uh, now Kyle Broderick doing some high throughput sequencing to see if we can pick out you know what what is with gallmage uh, a lot of things show up. <laughs> Well, do we want to call call the meeting? Well, it's noon, and move, I think we we'll slowed down. Move to adjourn. <laughs> Second. Yes. Yep, next week. Yeah, okay. come, come back next week, 10 a.m. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye.